Brothers and sisters, Christ is risen. Alleluia. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for this time to be together, for this time to be known as your people. Give us courage in these challenging moments. Help us to face the days ahead, knowing that you dwell with us, that here we, this earth, this world that you created, is your abiding place. Help us to dwell in you and to let our troubled hearts relax, be called home. We pray together in your Son's name, Jesus Christ, our risen Savior. Amen. Do not let your hearts be troubled. That is easier said than done, is it not? Back in the day, of course, this was also easier said than done. Jesus is offering these words to his disciples just after he's told them that he's going to be crucified. Go to Jerusalem. And three days later, rise again, but they're not going to have him around anymore. If there was ever a time to be troubled as a disciple of Jesus, now would be it, right? You followed him, professed your love of him, and now he says he's leaving? If there's ever a time to run around like Chicken Little and scream, the sky is falling, now is it. Because not only do the disciples have to carry on without Jesus being there, but they have to carry on the ministry that is going to lead to his crucifixion. They will have to go against what their ruling authorities deem a loyal citizen should do. Jesus seems to know this, for at the end of our selected passage for today, he tells them that whatever they ask for in his name, he will do. It doesn't take a large stretch of the imagination to think that they might cry out, well, then stay, stay with us, right? But he can't. They, of course, the disciples, they do not understand. For who could? We try all these years later, and we know that at the end of the story is, and yet we still struggle to understand right along with them. Why did he have to go and die? And through it all, the disciples and all of us are to not let our hearts be troubled. I looked it up. I'm having trouble turning the page. I looked it up, and uh, the word for troubled is just what we thought it might be, right? Sometimes you look Greek words up and they have a whole different realm of meaning, not this one. It's meant to convey a sense of inward turmoil, that your calmness, your serenity, your peace of mind has been taken away by something that's gone on, and you're now left anxious, distraught, distressed, filled with doubt about what now lies ahead. Does that describe any of you? Has it described any of you over the past couple of months? When are we going to get back to normal? What is normal going to look like? Are they going to find a vaccine? When will I be able to receive it? What about my loved ones? Is someone I know and love going to contract this virus? Am I going to lose someone close to me? Can I go to the grocery store? Is that even safe anymore? Any and all of these questions are reasonable and are brought on by the uncertainty that abounds all around us. And somehow we're not supposed to have troubled hearts? 
promise that Jesus gives is about preparing the disciples and us for a dwelling place, a heavenly dwelling place, are the words that John uses. Last week, we heard one of the iconic passages used often for funerals, Psalm 23. This week, we have another. When we, as people of faith, come to the end of our lives, we long to hear the promise that there is something else prepared for us, that there's something more. And here it is, right? Jesus tells his disciples and all of us that he goes to prepare a place for them. That through him they will know how to get there. That in him they have the way. Now they don't understand this, but I'm willing to bet that we do. That through Jesus we know that we have access to something beyond this life here and now. The disciples have immense trouble embracing this, but we've been well-schooled into this train of thought that knowing that the pearly gates await us once this life is over. Our challenge is that that doesn't do much for the trouble our hearts might feel right here and now, does it? I don't know about you, but I long for something a little bit more hopeful than just knowing that if it doesn't work out, everything will be okay. Ultimately, that's reassuring, but right now, I want more of an answer than that. And here we finally reveal the ways in which the brokenness of the world in which we're a part meets the profound depth of those who Jesus walked with as well. You see the words for dwelling places that the Gospel of John uses? It's often translated mansions, which is even a further distortion, really, for us. Have you ever heard that? that in my Father's house are many mansions. These, those words are actually words that are used and meant to convey an abiding presence. Remember, for the Gospel of John, Jesus is the word that became flesh and dwelled in the world. Or as our brother Eugene would say, in our neighborhood. The idea is that Jesus didn't just come down from heaven to die on a cross to transact a new pathway for us to get to the life hereafter. He was God's full abiding presence that becomes the very pathway himself toward a rich and full lived life with God. To put it another way, we aren't supposed to escape this life into a heavenly one, but rather in Jesus we are to see how much we have failed to celebrate, recognize, dwell in God's heavenly presence here, now, and for eternity. It turns out that the promise Jesus embodies isn't just about what happens after we die, but rather about transforming the whole of our life right now. Now, I'll admit that right now, at this moment, this reality is really hard for us to see. It's hard because the same forces that sought to hang Jesus on the cross are still active and alive in the world today. Forces of greed, of power, of control, of abuse, hardship, systems of brokenness, self-indulgent appetites, disease, natural or man-made, human-made disasters. And it's especially hard because we're living into one of those realities right this moment. It's natural, then, for us to feel a little lost, sad, maybe, 
broken, grieving. For the problems that we might normally see happening somewhere else are happening right here and now to us. I watched a program on television the other day. This actually was about the Arab Spring that occurred in Syria. Do you all remember that? It feels like that happened ages ago when all the Syrian migrants and others were streaming into Europe and other places. The program traced how that all started. That it started in the summer of 2009 or 10 with a drought in Australia. That drought impacted the ability of Australian farmers to grow wheat. Apparently, we in the north all get a lot of our wheat from the southern hemisphere during the winter months. That then extended to the next growing season in China, where they also had a drought, a drought that was called the Thousand Year Drought, something they had never seen before. Their wheat crops also failed. This led to people, particularly vulnerable people, being unable to eat. Prices went up 300% seemingly overnight. This led to unrest. And with governments being unstable in some regions of the world, it led to governments being overthrown. And throughout it all, I couldn't help but think that while I remember watching it on the nightly news, I don't remember feeling or seeing those impacts here. And I make that comment to be less about a patting ourselves on the back and more about the fact that we aren't escaping this tragedy today here. It's not happening somewhere else. It's happening here and now to us. People in communities, in places where you have relatives or friends, they are impacted by this. My sister took a COVID test just two weeks ago, as did her husband, and we wondered with them what it would mean for their three young boys if they were positive. We can't escape this reality today. And so it's natural for us to feel lost, broken, or perhaps to use the words of our passage today, to have troubled hearts. But just like his words to the disciples so long ago, on the eve of leaving them in the world, we need to know that Jesus' abiding presence had the final victory on that Easter Sunday. That it wasn't just a victory that's meant to accomplish salvation here after we die. It was that. But it was also a victory over all the forces that defy God's rule in our world. It says that God will and does eternally abide with us, dwell with us, live with us, day in and day out. That God has moved into the neighborhoods of our lives and does not leave. That we are not left alone in this life. And especially when bad things happen, when life seems like it's too much, God seeks ever to draw close and abide with us. Brothers and sisters, we've been given the abiding presence of God in our lives. It is there in your home right now. You don't need to come here to find it. I wish you could. I wish I wasn't alone here right now. But it's there with you. God is with you in your home. So do not be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in Jesus. You have been welcomed into a holy community right here and now. Once this life is over and right now. You are a part of of a community, not just as Eidsvold Lutheran Church, 
but God's community of brothers and sisters in friendship with our Lord. Whether you meet here or are there in your home, do not despair. God in Christ is with you. Do not let your hearts be troubled. God dwells with you wherever you are. Amen. <laughs>